Okay, friends. So welcome everybody to a special uh, coaching call specifically for PhD um, and dissertate, dissertator writers. Now, you know, honestly, a lot of what I'm going to say remains very relevant as you continue your career post your uh, PhD years and also probably is relevant for people writing their MA thesis. So, I mean, it's, it's somewhat artificial to separate out the dissertation crowd. But having said that, there is a special kind of hell <laughs> reserved for those stuck or, I don't even like to use the word stuck in this sense, but, but stuck in dissertation or, or let's say this, if you are in your dissertation um, project um, end times and you're feeling like you're not making the progress um, there is, it's very common to have a confluence of stressors that all kind of converge upon you in this uh, particular time in your life um, that just, yeah, it's like a special place in hell for that. Um, me, myself, um, my experience in dissertation was not very different. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, again, I, I keep forgetting that not everybody knows me. Uh, my doctor, my doctor is named Sharon Shachaf. <laughs> this is to show everybody and role model. You don't have to be perfect. Today was one of those days I had a very bad night's sleep and like just all over the place. So... Here we go. We are just swinging it. We are not perfect. So I'll try again. I'm Dr. Sean Shachaf. Um, I am uh, the founder and uh, I'm administrating the uh, Facebook group called Academic Writers Unblocked. I am a writing coach in my academic career. I'm a global media scholar. Um, for many years, I was faculty at uh, Georgia State University and uh, also uh, University of Texas where I got my PhD. I've served specifically for, um, today. okay, hang on. Lots of people are now joining, All right? So, or not lots of people, but I heard some beeps. So um, I really loved working with graduate students. I had six PhD students that I was the main advisor for. I wasn't, I can't even remember the number of committees because I was uh, uh, known to be somebody that uh, can be counted on to do this work. I was, you know, a frequent um, participant in, in, in dissertation committees, not just in my institutions, but in other institutions where, uh, uh, you know, people wanted uh, me as an outside reader for dissertation on global media studies. So I really have a lot of, um, a lot of ex relevant experience. I've seen a lot of people through this process of getting the, you know, I always try to minimize it, getting the two letters before your name, right? Because there is something where it, it's a bit of um, rite of passage. And I think this is also why so many times there are such unconscious emotional back like something is going on emotionally that's not necessarily fully conscious that ends up being such a good friend to your writer's block when you have a dissertation um you know we tend to lose scope of projects especially when they have a big emotional when the stakes are high right when uh we feel a lot is writing on the project so you know it could be your dissertation it could be your ma thesis it could be this article that you're writing and you're you're really dangled before yourself that you're going to send it to the best journal in your field you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not just um in in the dissertation uh situation that this can happen but definitely when it's um something that has institutional consequences and you've worked for so long to get to that point and you've done your coursework. I mean, if you're in, um, in the United States, you know, you have to do uh, um, coursework as well as then getting through writing a proposal and defending, the, oh, sorry, coursework. And then you do your comprehensive exams and then you do your proposal and you defend that. And then you write your dissertation and then you defend just so it's like, one of those processes that that's is just seems designed to create a lot of uh, emotional pitfalls and just make the actual significance of 
doing the thing bigger than, than what doing the thing really is about. Because um, at the end of the day, I mean, I know, yes, a dissertation is not just a seminar paper. It's not the same as writing, you know, you can write three seminar papers at the end of the semester and, you know, write it to the deadline and crash and still get your A or your B plus, you know, for one of them. Uh, it, same goes for comps, you know, you can kind of just, you know, stress up until the time comes and then it's three days and you do it and you're done. But with a dissertation, I think a lot of what happens is that if you had a writing practice or a, a, you didn't have a writing practice, you had a lack of a writing practice, but you relied on habits where it was, I'm just going to wait until the stress is so big that I'm just going to, you know, get through the avoidance by making myself and be miserable and just sit there and write it. That kind of practice usually does not, it's not enough when it's, when, when you're reaching the point where you need to write a dissertation because a dissertation, as somebody said in one of the groups where I asked for questions about this, it's a marathon, marathon and not a sprint. And so it's very true and I very much agree with that. Except, I mean, I don't know, do people that run marathon really enjoy it? So I will say, okay, then there you go. It's a marathon. I mean, the way I would want to rewrite that story because what I've heard in that story is anguish. Oh, it's a marathon, right? So I want to say it can be a marathon for somebody that really enjoys them. You can enjoy writing your dissertation. I, I mean, or at least parts of it. I really do think that if we can remember that, that can really help. Uh, so again, Something that I always say early on, working with everybody and in these presentations as well, is that you need to remember you wanted to do this thing. This is something you wanted to do. You had a contribution that you wanted to um, offer the world. You worked, you know, tirelessly. And today we're going to talk about some of the stages because you might still be working on uh, on locating the topic and asking a question about the topic and doing the research. And now you need to write, you know. Uh, Kind of tell everybody about the process and what you uh, went through. Um, and Megan is saying, if you uh, learn to train pro properly, then a marathon is enjoyable. If you aren't, uh oh, it went away. Okay, chat. If you aren't, it is horrible. Perfect example for a dissertation. Exactly. Exactly. And and here is the little dirty secret again. And I feel like I'm repeating myself a little because I've been doing uh, a lot of these calls this week, but. Um, we are not being trained properly in many, many, many places. I, I mean, I'm sure there are some places where you are uh, trained. I, I know I trained my students. I tried to train them properly uh, as writers. Uh, but part of the problem with the dissertation is that, uh, uh, or with, you know, if, if you're struggling, it's usually because you really weren't afforded an opportunity to teach yourself and, and develop your writing practice in a way that would sustain you through such a big project. Big, not just in word number, but just big in terms of the significance to you emotionally and in terms of, you know, the liminality, right? Some anthropologists here, right? When we have a rite of passage, it's going to invoke not just our own psyche and to pit it in kind of a battle, but also people around us. People really respond and um, one of these, one of uh, the questions that I really liked that I got from the Dr. Mom group was, how do, I, um, how do I shut down the noise from outside of people continuously asking me, you know, how is it going? How is it going? This is such a good question. And, you know, I gave my quick answer and I'll get to the answers and questions later. But I mean, my, my main answer to that was like, shut it down by line. And by, what I mean by line is, Think about like a, a Teflon kind of, you know, surface that nothing can rub on, right? Or nothing can, you know, very, very smooth. What I would do whenever I'm working on anything and somebody's asking me, and a lot of times these, you know, these are well-intended humans who are in your life and they're, they think they're helping or, or they're overly identifying with you and they're freaking out. And so maybe I know maybe maybe they think they're helping but maybe it's their anxiety about you finishing and that's what makes this so bad so I learned to just tell everybody it's going great I made great progress and in a way I was teaching myself to actually approach in a similar way 
myself and tell myself and be able to celebrate, you know, little achievements that lead to the big goal. You cannot do this in one day. You cannot do this in one month. You cannot, right? So you have to learn to be able to recognize first between you and yourself that you're making progress. Um, even in the days that feel really stuck. But in terms of the outside world, I just learned that if I tell them, you know, if it's my mom or my mother-in-law or my husband or my, I don't know, whatever it is, if I just say, I'm, I'm even something like, I'm happy. I'm happy with my work today. Today was good, you know, it's fine. Or, you know, I, I, I just try not to inform in too much detail. I inform that I'm, I'm on it, I'm putting in my hours, it's coming along. But it's nobody's business to get in your business like that. And if they're asking because you feel like they're freaking out and that their freak out freaks you out, then a little bit of lying here to just say, every time they ask you, go like, great. You know, I'm so not that person. I overly inform. I'm always like, oh. um, but what happens with this is that it can lead people to try to control you. They may mean to or not mean to, but when you overshare, it exposes you to be controlled, you know? Somebody can ask because they really have the best intentions, but they're your roommate or your partner and they live with you. And you know, when you get to a fight about the dishes next time, this person might be not their best self in that moment and use against you what you had shared about your process and where you are. So yeah, in general, oversharing leads, to, you know, it opens you up to being controlled manipulated, um, fucked with, you know, whatever you want to call it. So that's, that's one big advice that I have is just own it up for yourself and take your part back to you in the process. So I don't even remember how I went into that question, but <laughs> that was a good question. Um, okay. Oh, oh the, the, I, know, I remember now the significance. So the reason that a lot of people are on you with the um, dissertation is that especially as you get closer and closer to finishing, it becomes significant because when you finish, there's a big life transition. So I really, this is so important to name uh, as we start this out the gate, right? You, you, you are not going to be living probably in the same place when you are done, you know, uh, people who depend on this becoming a job for you, you know, people in your life uh, that don't want you to leave or they do want you to leave or your partner is waiting for you to be done or, whatever it is, they, it gets intensified. And everybody just like steps into that little bubble that you're trying to create around your process so that you can do what you need to do and finish. And this is unhelpful. So this is why a lot of the times writing a dissertation becomes a very stressful, hectic time in your life. And it can become very, you know, you can get very blocked. Now, there is also something to be said about, you know, I'm, I'm careful saying that because it's true that, that you can, that having a meltdown can spell the fact that you are making progress. So, you know, I, I know a lot of advisors say, well, when my student comes to me and has this big breakdown, I'm saying I'm happy because I know now it's going to start progressing. But if you know me even a little by now, you know that I don't, <laughs> I don't like that that's the way you know, people approach, it has to be a crisis, it has to be horrible, it has to be, it's just, I am suspicious of that. It's true that if you don't have good work habits, and if you don't have a good process that aligns with your inner passion to do the work, uh, yeah, it's very uh, common to, you know, experience those big meltdowns. I'll say another thing about that, that brings me to another point, which is the conditions of production. And even the fact that I need to do this call, cool. It doesn't look to me like a lot of you have a lot of good support from your advisors. Now, I don't know about your advisors and I know that even advisors that are really well-intentioned, well-intended, uh, capable individuals might be just stretched too thin and they cannot give you the attention. And what I'm trying to say about that is many times, it's only when you are ready to melt down that you can get the attention because your advisor is doing teaching and service and this and that and the other. And only when you get to their office and you're in complete meltdown, can you get the attention that you need. Um, so trying to be kind 
to dissertation advisors, I will put this back on us, the meaning on you, whoever is hearing this in, and will listen later. When you learn to work in a way that's more gradual, regular, and you start making progress in a way that is a little bit more steady, and not, I'm not saying you can have this big burst of progress, but um, it might help the advisor as well, if, if, you know, if we're not talking about like this crazy, bad narcissist advisor, but somebody that's really interested in helping, um, it can always help the person to help you when you're helping yourself kind of deal. So there is, you know, there is also, I know that other side of people who are avoiding so much that, you know, me as an advisor, I can't get you to stop avoiding beyond you know and if me i couldn't get people to stop avoiding you can imagine the people without the training that i have you know sometimes they just feel helpless when you get so stuck that you're like in your own hell that they don't know what to do with you anymore right and so they can't really help so i think a lot of this dysfunction can be helped by um and you know that's always my main advice by you becoming mindful of the, on, uh, about the writing process. Uh, I have piled a bunch of books as always today as well. Today I went more into the craft area, uh, but before we look in the craft, I will remind you uh, that um, all the books that I love to remind you every time, like for example, On Being Stuck by Lauren Herring. There's another one, uh, Roseanne Bain, Around the Writer's Block, I've shared many times. Um, Around the Writer's Block on dealing with uh, um, you know, the, the brain science behind writer's block. I'm not getting too much into that today. I'm just sharing a little bit because not everybody are in all of my presentations. This one is fantastic. Dancing in the Dragon Den. So this one, which uh, those of you who are joining my class, we will be working with this one uh, for a, a full week, I think. Uh, this is a kind of like Jungian shadow work. Um, you know, I said before, Jung talks about whatever we don't bring into consciousness appears in our life as destiny, as fate, right? So basically, if, you know, the stuff that gets you blocked, if you are unconscious about it, it manifests as a block, you know? So shadow work could be really useful, not when your back is to the wall and you need to produce that last chapter of the dissertation probably, but this is a recommendation for working on your your writing practice but also working on yourself as a writer working on under you know bringing into consciousness so this is a, a lot about you know bringing um again i i'm not gonna get into it too much in detail but uh the whole idea of of you know jung jungian theory is that in the first half of our life right we build our ego our conscious self uh but the self is bigger than just the ego right the self is or, you know, he, he has this Venn diagram, like the center of the self, you know, is, is there's like, if, you, if the ego is a little circle, there's a bigger self, a bigger circle, that's the self, which is the unconscious part. And the center of yourself is not in the center of the ego, but it's kind of on the, um, ah, shit, I'm just gonna do it. I'll show you the, the uh, right. So here is yourself, and this is your ego. And your center is kind of like here. It's in the center of the big circle, not in the center of the ego. Why am I saying all of this? So this is the, the Jung thing. Jung says in the first half of our life, we build our ego. How do we build our ego? We decide what is appropriate. This is us. So for example, we don't kill people. So when we build, my ego is I don't kill people. You put in the shadow killing. All right, now think about other things. We do it by the time we're seven. So mom says, don't touch there, that's dirty. So we put touching there in the shadow. Now Jung says, when you get to around you know, 30 or 40, your job is to revisit what's in the shadow and make new judgments about whether or not what you consciously decided is appropriate and unconsciously decided you know to put in the shadow maybe we need to make new decisions as a grown-up about what is appropriate for us in our life so this is a big segue into something that we were working on the class and so um i think everybody on this call probably knows that there's an upcoming workshop and i will talk uh, more about this later because i do want to invite those of you who are not signed up i have two students who are signed up megan and anoop um but 
this is in preparation to us talking more about the craft and the style and you know today we will talk more about that for a dissertation writing specifically okay so um let me just get into unless somebody want that's on the call wants to ask start us off with a question which I would really love to hear, or if, I, I would actually love it if you guys could just say quickly who you are. If you want me to pause the recording, I can do that. Um, Megan, I, you, you've already introduced yourself. Uh, you didn't introduce yourself, but maybe start, can you start people off? Because I really want to know who is on the call. Sure, yeah. My name is Megan Paramaki brown I'm an associate professor of archaeology uh, at U Athabasca University in Canada. Um, I'm interested in this particular Zoom call because I do have uh, graduate students working on dissertations and I'm one of the people who received very bad advice on the writing process. <laughs> I, I finished my dissertation, uh, obviously, um, but I don't want to be repeating bad advice and I, I feel that there very much is sort of a culture of I suffered through my dissertation and that's part of being a grad student, therefore you should suffer too. And oh. I don't want to be someone who repeats that. Thank you so much for, for saying all of this and for doing this for your students. You know, this is what we need. And so, yeah, and I was gonna say, so you got the two letters before your name, you know, you got the DR before your name and now you are looking to not reproduce. And I really love what you said that because, oh my God, let me not segue into this. Yes, people in academia going like, I suffered and therefore you should suffer. And it all needs to be suffering. I had the same, um, it's also kind of like what aboutism, but what about me? You know, you're telling me that you have a baby, but I had two babies and I was swinging on a ball and I held an umbrella. Okay, Dr. Seuss, much? All right. And I was doing this and I was doing that. So, you know, I mean, what kind of a human person responds that way when, when somebody is suffering? You know, or worse, or worse, how dare you have a baby while you're doing this? Because I know people who have have said that to their students. So. I had a colleague when I got yes, <laughs> Lauren is <laughs> where you told that I when I got pregnant in the, but uh, you know I came in with a newborn and I got pregnant again and I had a colleague who actually responded as if I said I had terminal cancer when I you know <laughs> and it was a wanted pregnancy. Okay, she was like, oh no, I'm like no no no, <laughs> this is the plan, uh, but she wanted me on the graduate committee or something. So very important stuff, but I'm very, very happy. I kept the baby after all, and uh, he's nine now. So I'm very glad I did that <laughs> anyways. But yeah, so yeah, so I try not to segue, but this, look, this is a big problem now. So I know a lot of the people that ask me the questions, again, this is, uh, I have people in uh, my group, people in uh, groups that are specifically for moms getting their PhD. So I, want to acknowledge you don't have to be a mom I was not a mom when I was doing my dissertation but it was still um, bringing out all the demons to dance there is something about that um, moment where you're supposed to step up as your own independent voice in a field that you've spent time you know you've learned the field you've learned the subject matter you've, you've, you've taken coursework you've written papers you've already introduced you know some arguments in hopefully in conferences, et cetera, et cetera. But something about the dissertation is this, um, again, as I said, I keep going back to a rite of passage because, you know, it's like your bat mitzvah or getting your period. Well, you can see, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm Israeli. So those, or a quincenera, right? Those moments where you are passing from one status to another status, and they tend to invoke extra, you know, so it's not so much about sometimes about the craft. I feel like so many times when I work with people who are doing dissertation or their tenure book or stuff like that, they can do it when we actually get through the obstacles and the hurdles of the fear and everything emotionally that's attached. So that's why I'm taking the time to do it. Lorraine, do you want to say hi today? And I hope I'm saying your name right. And I love your setup. You're like sitting there comfortably. I'm sorry I'm messing it up. <laughs> oh no because i can see you on the tv oh fantastic We're yeah, broadcasting. Yeah, yeah see everyone's like big i feel bigger now <laughs> yeah, I can put my feet up so it's just that otherwise i have to move my laptop back and forth so yeah anyways hi megan anyways um yeah let's yeah, just can you introduce yourself 
Uh, so my name is Lorraine Stroud Cotter, and I live in Calgary, Canada. Oh, nice. And it's snowing right now, so I can see the snow. Anyways, um, my degrees are in geology, actually. So, um, like, even when I did, like, my undergraduate thesis, yeah, it was like, here, hand it in, no feedback. <laughs> So, so you all, already all you, all you ever heard was uh, so how's it going? When when are you gonna hand it in? You know, sort of thing. So isn't um, it amazing though that they just you know expect you to somehow teach yourself how to do this? Yeah. Well the same thing happened sort of with my masters sort of thing. And so what I end up doing because uh, I didn't have any kind of direction, so I just end up kind of defending it. And then, you know, when I had all my corrections, it's just like, oh, okay, that's when I'm supposed to be, you know, kind of, that's how I got my feedback. So you of only thing. got your feedback and when you defend the thing. So yeah. did you, are you working on your, on your PhD now or are you already a doctor? Um, okay, that's, let's just say, yeah, I'm kind of finally working towards it. A lot of stuff has gone on. Um, let's just say I had all my kids when I was in school. And even though it kind of, it took me longer but at the same time, once I started working like full time, it was a lot easier to have my kids while I was in school because, yes. you know, I, I could, I, you might understand kind of thing. There, but the thing is, um, okay, so it took me five years to do my undergraduate instead of sort of four kind of thing. I had my first daughter. Again, that's not atypical when you have uh, children. So, but but okay, so you're you are in the constituency of people working on their yeah on their yeah so that, yeah anyways that's um so there was all that because being a geologist I'm just <laughs> saying back then especially when I did my undergraduate okay I'm 51 now okay so back you know way back when um, even as case okay, as a geologist um, it was really difficult to just even as a woman. That sort of thing because there was a you know prejudice yes i'm sure right yeah okay it's, so yeah let's just say not only going on dealing with like little feedback but it was just like oh you know you're you know a woman geologist out you know doing field work and just like oh my god kind of thing right wow okay yeah, yeah that's so, an obstacle in itself i can yeah, i can that is an obstacle sort of thing so now let's just say um i'm trying to once again um, get back into, you know, kind of working towards my PhD and getting that kind of, well, like I said, working towards it kind of thing. So, so you know, if any, any, hearing, help, any help in writing is, is always good help. So if I'm hearing correctly, and I think that this is shared among, especially, not again, not just per, people who become parents. I, I keep saying moms, but it's, it, you know, I'll say people who become parents. Um, yeah. But I mean, there are other circumstances. It's not atypical for people to be working on their PhD and kind of lose touch with it and go back in. I, 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 I've, you know, worked with many people who've had that, and 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 it presents a specific kind of challenge when you're, you know, whenever you leave something alone, you need to get or you decide to get back to it. So I do want to acknowledge that, you know, you for your perseverance in that because I know how hard it can be, you know, and. What I tell people, you know, a lot of time we accuse shame about this. Oh, you know, I'm less than because I didn't just go in and I did it on the timeline and that was the timeline. This is what everybody needs to do. I mean, life happens, you know, you're getting your education. If you're getting a PhD, then it means you've been in school for what, like 24 years at least. From yeah. first grade. <laughs> like, think about it, right? I think, I think I've been in school for 24 yeah. years from first grade to PG and I didn't do, you know, I, I'm Israeli, so I had the army service, I traveled, I went back, you know, nobody lives your life. This is your life. What happened in your life, you know, you need to stand strong in what your timeline is. I mean, it does, again, open up some vulnerability in the system, like even the way we have the funding for the system, you know, funding for first year, funding for, you know, I remember that I, you can get caught up in it. I got caught up in it too, in two ways. So, for example, there was a, a very competitive grant, a fund, uh, fellowship at the University of Texas in Austin that uh, I was ready to go up for on my fourth year, but my department viewed it as something that is for the fifth year students. So, even though I was the most deserving, they didn't let me even apply, right? 
Uh, but that was maybe the only time in my life that I was in, like the rest of the time. Even when I started my tenure track job, and because I had the two babies, I was kind of lagging in, you know, time from degree. So when I started submitting for grants, a lot of some people said, well, she's that many years out of the degree, and we wanted to see more whatever, right? So it's always an issue when you're not that stereotypical person just following along with the exact timing. But on the other hand, you know, I've seen people like going back and or taking 12 years to finish. Well, and that's, okay. that's the magic number, right? But you know, I, I've seen people finishing really quickly and crashing and burning in their career. And I've seen people who took time, but they have a very solid career. So don't let that be, you know, something that in and of itself um, convinces you that you're somehow doomed. All right. Oh no, let's just say, I, let's just say, I mean, you know, plugging away kind of thing. And because of my geology career, I've always been able to kind of stay on top of things, sort of things. So, um, and whenever I think about, because um, even the stuff that was, is with my research and, and stuff like this, stuff didn't get published for 20 or 30 years because of people, you know, how long it took them and stuff happened. And then whenever I think about age, I always think about Brian Mays from Queen because he finally got his PhD, like when he was like, what, 55, 60. So he's my inspiration, right? <laughs> Fantastic inspiration, yes. <laughs> yeah, like whenever I, you know, I just put on my queen and it's like, okay, you know. <laughs> yeah, one of my coolest students ever, uh, I will not name her, but she came to get a degree in film after many, many years having a career in, in well, in post-production, but that career in the industry. And so she got the degree, she was kind of every, again, she was this one person that everybody projected on, well, you're out of time, we don't understand exactly, what are you going to do with this? And, you know, her son was going to college while she was getting her PhD. So she just went, because he was in Georgia, she came to Georgia to do it. You know what, she finished, the, she finished it and became a chair immediately of this, because they wanted her specific industry uh, experience alongside the, um, the PhD just allowed her um, to just immediately go. So, you know, you can, you can make up for lost time, you know, like they do in the airplane, you know, if you're on the tarmac and it's, it's a long wait and yeah. they just fly faster and you still get to your destination. Remember when we used to go on airplanes? Anyways, that's a metaphor. That All right. Well, I, think, I, think, yeah, I think it's important. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just going to say one last thing. I think it's important and what's helped me plugging, you know, along through everything, right, is to, that you have to believe in yourself, kind of no one else can do that for you, sort of thing. It's like, you know, I believe that I can, you know, get this done still, you know? <laughs> I sort of am a hundred, you know, I'm a hundred percent with you on this one. Yes, you have to hold on your own. You know, yeah, nobody else is gonna um, come and, I'll yeah, say, yeah. If people believe in you and from the outside, but you don't believe in yourself, you can't do it. But if you believe in yourself and, and they don't believe from the outside, then you can still do it. All right, I'm going to jump to uh, yeah, resolution. Um, uh, and thank you so much, Oren. I was, okay, I wanted thanks. to do okay. last time too. Um, so later on, if I'm not answering, uh, I'm going to answer all the questions. So later on, if, if you have a still remaining questions, I would be happy to hear. So I'll just say that Rosalina, you can, everybody saw on the chat, she said that her mic is not uh, working. So looking for some tips so that I can make a good progress. I have to, because lately it's been a little stalled. Uh, I have two kids who uh, are very supportive. My husband is also very supportive as well. I can't understand why I can't concentrate on my writing. So Rosalina, I'll just say right away, is it's COVID times, right? So you're telling me it's in the last two months, you haven't made any progress. Um, I am going to assume and ask, right? And you can comment, um, things that were available to you, like time alone may not, no longer be available to you. Uh, I said in the last call I've done, solitude, you know, um, uh, solitude is the medium of creativity right? We need some time completely alone outside of the presence and the energy of other people. And sometimes, we, you know, 
it's a combination like I for it or 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 you need time in a coffee shop where you have people around but they're not people who depend on you you know I, your kids sound older but like you know depend on you to wipe their asses basically or you know or, or feed them or support them or give, so if we are 24 7 with the family and I call it in the family soup and listen I love my family right so I love that soup but it's one flavor, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's soup. Sometimes you want to be in a swimming pool. You don't want to be in a soup. Let me mix the metaphors, right? So I cannot en emphasize enough taking solitary, whatever you are allowed to do within the corona, you know, some countries won't even allow you to be out in nature. And so, you know, but if you are, if you can go out, be in nature, be alone, or be in a coffee shop where it's outdoors, we have a few of like socially distant outdoor coffee shops, just take a drive. So, you know, I, I know somebody in Israel early on, they didn't let people do anything at all. They cannot even go to the, you know, the shore, but uh, they could go to the grocery store. So she would say she was, you know, if they'll stop me, I'll say I'm on the way. And she just took really long drives just to get that time alone. So I would say this would be my first, just guessing. Uh, I would consider that part of the time that I'm taking away from to work. So if I know that this is the time I'm helping the kids with school and this is the time I'm cooking, this is the time, whatever it is, I all, and then there's the time I, I do work. Out of the time, I, would, I was taking solitary walks and wasn't expecting myself to do any writing like this because I didn't even know how to come to my desk when everybody's in the house and any minute somebody could come in and interrupt. I could not, I couldn't even, I needed to restart my whole writing practice and so, again, I have been working on my writing process for long enough to know that if there's a big change, I stop everything and I just become very attentive. I'm listening inside. What do I need? But I do know that I need solitary time, time alone. I need for that time to not be structured with an agenda when I'm like, I know I have to do this. I need some time where I can loosely think about my best ideas come to me when, you know, you know, like when you're on the bathroom or I remember when I had a scooter, when I was getting my BA, I would call it scooter thoughts. Like I would have those moments of like Eureka when I was just driving on my scooter. So don't leave this to chance. Schedule the time that would allow you to be very relaxed. We need time when we are not thinking about anything in particular and it counts as work time. So I would start there. Uh, Rosalina, and you can uh, uh, answer to see, I don't know if she's, oh yeah, you're still here. Let me know if this sound, if this is resonating. Uh, think about what is it that you need that you had before when you were making progress that is now gone because of the changes around you. Another possibility is that you were working well, you reached you know, a moment of transition. You finished something, you finished a chapter, you finished whatever, uh, you, uh, and now there's a new challenge and it's percolating, right? Sometimes you just need to let it kind of percolate. I do believe we know what the next right step is if we don't let the panic of, I'm not doing the next thing, right? If you just, so you take a walk, you just think about it. If it's helping you to talk to a good friend. Um, so I have a good friend, she lives in Switzerland and we're not on the same time, uh, you know, anymore, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I use WhatsApp. And so I would just record messages to her. And sometimes I even tell her, don't even listen, but it helps me to imagine her as my addressee. And I would say, oh, I'm stuck because blah, 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 blah. my husband, blah, blah, you know, like complaining, all the things that are in my mind. Um, and just creating that space where I feel supported because I know that she will hear it. Or even if she wouldn't listen to it because it, it gets too long, just imagining that I'm talking to her and not to just myself gave me that ex gives me that extra feeling that there is someone in my corner that is supporting me. So here's just, you know, I'm giving you again, and I'm guessing at what might be going, but if you can't concentrate or you're right on your writing, that's a fact. Okay. This is not a shortcoming or a failure on your part. This is something that's happening. Fighting the fact that this is happening by shaming yourself, getting angry at yourself, judging yourself, it's not going to make you more concentrated. Actually, the opposite is correct, right? It's just going to create more noise. So that's my quick advice on, on stuff like that. If 
I, I will say another thing. When you learn to work on your writing process, I have one thing that's guaranteed. Once you get it to work, there's a time limit on that. It's like the hourglass turn. And when you're really cooking and you're going well, just know that it's not going to last forever. And that's okay. Because writing is a process with a lot of stages. And it's not... It's gestation, right? So, you know, like pregnancy, I love using the love metaphors, as you can see, you know, what happens to your body and to the embryo in, you know, week one is not what happens in week 34. If you're going to, you know, you can't try to control and make your, your fetus be in week 34 if you're in week 14. It's, it's all the attempts to kind of uh, impose from your conscious mind and God forbid from your willpower, I'm going to talk, about, I always, you know, talk about the willpower thing needs to just not be a part of the creative process. Beyond the fact that, yes, I want to do it. Just the rest of it, if you're trying to force things, you're going against creativity because creativity resides in a totally different area than willpower. If you have to force yourself, it's not... I mean, it can happen, but it's going, that's going to be the kind of kicking and screaming. Like, think about marriage. Marriage, okay? Think, think about marriage or a relationship. If you have to force two people together, there's no, not going to be sparks, all right? You got to think about your work as something that you're willing to flirt with, court, you know, uh, Wait for consent. I love all of those metaphors, right? I mean, if you will think about your relationship with your writing, just like you would think about, you know, a sexual or an intimate relationship, you're going to cringe like hell about your lack of waiting for consent. <laughs> you need to be willing to wait for consent with your, you know, you want to call it the muse, you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, you can have regular dates where you are there and you show up for your writing, but you can't force it to open up to you, right? So you're getting that metaphor and where this is going. All right, so these are like the bigger uh, kind of writerly things, but I do want to uh, delve more into the dissertation. But uh, the people who didn't introduce themselves, so you want to just quickly say your name and where you're from, and it's okay if you want to do it in the chat, but uh, it would be, be nice. Anoop, do you want to say hi? And I can. Yeah. Hi. So nice Hi. to see you, Sharon, and all of you, Megan and Lorraine. Thank you uh, for your introductions. I really love uh, this. I love this space. I am a PhD scholar. I am in the second year. I haven't started writing yet. But uh, I do have certain issues with uh, with with the environment in this uh, university. I feel, I mean, um, I'm okay, I'm dealing with it. But just that, I think if there were sort of more spaces where you could freely talk about things, voice your opinions, you know, think loudly, not be judged for what you think and feel and be, uh, it would have been much, much better. And I would right. You know, for some people, this could be the, the perfect fit and they feel like fish in water. And it's like, you know, I, I, you, know you, you, you feel like in your, you're in the right place exactly. But I think most people don't necessarily feel like that, you know. And so for different reasons, um, more generally, and this is a very general point I'm making, you know, we have a culture of posturing in academia where everybody's kind of bolstering their ego by you know, I, I talked about it in, in one of my first videos that was very uh, well watched. And, uh, you know, you go to a conference and what you're not supposed to project, oh, I'm struggling. You're supposed to be like, I wrote this and I did that. And, you know, you, you're because you're constantly on the market for the next job. Even if you have a good job, you're in a market, right? So what it creates, however, is like I so rarely, I stopped listening to papers when I was going still to conferences because I, I really like it when somebody comes out and says, I pulled my hairs out. Like, this is, come and workshop the thing. Tell me why 
it's hard. Tell me how it's challenging you. Because if you are writing paradigm shifting work, it can't be easy. So if everybody comes and try to make everything look so easy, you know, the, I just woke up like that gorgeousness, right? Oh no, you worked for hours. So I want to know about your, your struggles as well, you know? So, but again, so here's what I have to say about this. People connect, make a human connection with each other when they are willing to share vulnerability. When you come in and you're sharing that you're perfect, that does not invite another person to, to make a bond with you. So I think so often in, in PhD, you know, in those environments that academia creates, um, you know, we fall victim to this self perpetual like, I've seen it so many times with graduate students and they become depressed because they don't want it. It feels like so much to do before they can even show up to just come and be in a seminar because they feel like they have to be perfect. So again, me, what I did as a graduate advisor was to create, try to create a space where everybody felt comfortable um, coming as they are. I always say this and I will repeat it now. Writing or research or whatever it is should not be you know, you, you should not be pulling yourself by the bootstrap to be somewhere higher than where you are to begin. You need to begin where you are. You cannot, in fact, begin until you just accept where you are. And in, we're in a world where we're supposed to create knowledge, how can we create new knowledge if we are not comfortable saying we don't know something? So I really want, I want to encourage any, everybody that's on the call and listening later, is asking yourself this open-ended question. And this may sound like something trivial, but asking yourself open-ended question is a powerful, powerful coaching tool. So, you know, instead of asking, why am I a shit? You know, why do I suck? Why am I a failure? That's not an open, <laughs> curious question. But if you ask instead, how do I show up for this in a way that aligns with my passion? Or how do I show up with, confidence that it's okay to not have the answer, right? Those are the kind of questions that can shift your mindset to allow yourself to just be a fucking human being, you know, <laughs> that's trying to do something that's hard because academic writing is hard, you know, which brings me back to all of the questions. So I, I actually, this is, I compiled uh, categories of the questions that uh, were asked of me which made me really feel like, oh my God, you know, I really need to get going, cracking on finishing my book because people need that information out there. You all are not being supported in a minimal, I mean, if, if, if some of these things that, you're, that were asked show me that the programs you're in, whether they intend to or not, I'm not gonna try to like vilify, you know, if people don't know about how to construct a literature review, it's because your professors don't know how to do it and they're winging it, you know, and they're not training you because it's the easiest answer alive. And this is the one I will start with, by the way. All right, so anybody else wanna just say hi before we move on? But, oh, uh, Anoop, I just wanna say, so back to your, what I wanna take from your uh, comment and extrapolate more widely is that if you don't feel like you're in the right place, then you don't feel like the right opportunities are, and the right people are going to be, right, in the place. So I love what you said, though, that you're going to proactively try to create those bonds and, and find those, allow you to do that. But I would say you can maybe, you know, it's possible over time, you know, so when I first came to my graduate program, I felt very alienated from everybody. But, you know, over four years and five years at the end, um, I found my people. It just wasn't quick or easy. Right. So it takes time. So I would say that another thing, like the place that feels like the wrong place by being lived in can become your own. What makes a place your own is walking, you know, the, you know, walking uh, the pavement again and again, you know, take, so same with university, it can feel very alienating and, and, and not your place and you can make it your place by wearing it down just by participation. So I would say that, you know, don't give up on that because it's possible by merit of just perseverance to wait patiently until it becomes more comfortable, right? Like it's a, you know, uh, a new shoe that you, by wearing it and both wearing and wearing it, you, you, it becomes more comfortable. So that, that would be something that is a very good point. Uh, Robin, do you want to say hi? Or, cause I see, I see Robin and I don't know, Begonia. 
So if you don't, I don't want to force people, but if you want to say hi, let us know. Uh, can you okay. hear me? Yes. Hi, Robin. Hi. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, for me, it's like 11 uh, oh 30 goodness. at night. Yes, um, it's four here, four in the afternoon. So good night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm a PhD student at Marmara University in Istanbul, and I'm working on my thesis right now, but um, I'm kind of dealing with a lack of feedback and support, and I think compounded by uh, a language issue because my, my course is entirely in Turkish. And, and you sound, what, you sound a, a native English speaker. Yeah, I'm, I'm originally from the U.S. Okay, there you go. And let me know if you want me to pause this because it's again recorded and that might be good. <laughs> okay. The question of, you know, uh, how to be more productive, which was kind of what uh, Robin ended on. I, I, I think productive should be a forbidden word early on, at least in your in your process. I'll tell you why because, uh, well, it, it's, it's this assumption that production is, you know, how do you measure production is that you have number of pages or number of words written, but early on in a process when you're working on, so, so Robin, what year are you in? Uh, you said you just started, right? Yeah, I uh, finished my comps and now this year is uh, the start of the thesis. So you write, have you defended a proposal? Yes. Okay, so so you started, here's, here's the deal, you started, right? So when you have a proposal, it's already, you know, you produced something. But again, we're gonna talk a lot about transitions. So in the process of writing a dissertation, there are also some transitions. So the transition from proposal to dissertation writing, this is a big one. Now this can also vary because, you know, some people did all their research before they wrote the proposal. Some people, you know, did some research and then when you defended the proposal, they told you, oh, you need to do more research. So, um, you know, the, it, it changes, but the idea that I think productivity tends to trip us up because we tend to think that it, it looks like one thing, usually this, you know, the fingers flapping, you know, you're sitting there for eight hours and you're writing your dissertation where realistically, you know, it could be very, very productive to have a day when you are just going back and rereading all of your notes and you're yanking your hair up and you're just feeling confused and turned around in it and you immerse yourself in it. And then, you know, you take a day completely off and some, you know, and the, ne and the, and the next day something clicks. So what we tend to see as productive is a very narrow margin of activities. So I would really recommend everybody that, you know, as you're working, think about a day that you've spent unproductively that ended up being the most productive, you know, because we can kind of recognize this in retrospect. We can be like, oh, okay, I needed to go back and read all the articles. I can't tell you how vilified going back and reading all the articles is. So many people tell me, oh, I'm, I, one of my problems is that I always, I read too much. Right. And I, I mean, maybe, but I don't know. Sometimes you have to read too much before you, you understand why you went ahead and read, you know, more. So just trying to say there are going to be a lot of different activities. Writing is not just this. I think this is maybe 9%, not even 10% of activity is writing like this on your computer, writing, drafting, revising, all of that part. That's the last part of the writing process. But, uh, thinking about your structure, thinking about the elements, and this is what I wanna jump into, understanding the structure of your argument, understanding how your argument fits within everything that came before, right? Lit review and, and all of that, which is not technical, right? Um, that takes time. And it takes time where you are just sitting there thinking and maybe you are if you allow yourself to just journal and write about your process and what you're stuck on. So this is why I really recommend morning pages. Again, blank pages. Uh, I talked about it in my other videos. And you start your work process by sitting there and writing free flow. You know, uh, the recommendation is three pages. If this is too much for you, then it could be two pages. But create a ritual where you come to work 
and you start without having this, this um, preconceived notion of I gotta write five paragraphs, right? Because sometimes a really productive day of work is when you have 30 pages and you need to cut them down to 10 pages. Then how do you compute the productivity of that, right? If you are editing. So just different stages have different um, outcomes that are productive. This is what I'm, you know, how I'm going to, to put it. Okay, so now let me, uh, I want to just go into, so is anybody else, I'm trying to see if there's anybody else who wants to say, uh, Begonia, uh, you introduced yourself in the chat, so I'm not going to go into it into much uh, because you have no mic. All right, so let me jump into uh, the questions. I do want to, here's something I want to share. Let me see. All right, so I talked about this in my last thing, but I think it's going to be interesting to do with, um, let me see. All right, I want to talk to you guys about understanding the structure of, well, a research paper, but a dissertation specifically. And one thing that you need to understand about that, and you probably know this, but you know, it's, it's helpful to think through, uh, is that big things are composed of little ones. In that case, you know, a dissertation is composed of different chapters. Chapters are composed of different sections etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the structural relationship is in between the basic these basic units right so i'm, I'm jumping over some of this is is uh, i can't get into this because this is from a very long lesson but i do want to talk about the formula and structure of a research paper and i want to introduce to you my little hack that's called the i guess i call it tqmc uh the topic question method conclusions structure uh, I'm gonna stop sharing, okay. So this little ditty is really helpful in every stage. So even when you're thinking about your proposal and you wanna write a proposal, if you can outline by using this structure and when you are done with the proposal and you're ready to write your introduction, you know, the first uh, iteration of your introduction uh, and and it can help you kind of, I'll show you in a minute how it can help you lay out the structure of your, your chapters as well. Um, and then when you start writing and you get lost, you know, in the too muchness of your research and you're writing in circles or you're, you know, you're realizing that you're trying to put too many things into uh, one chapter. And so many times, let me say this to everybody watching this, you're going to think that something is in chapter two the famous chapter two. Chapter two usually becomes chapter two, you know, through five, right? Because we're trying to do everything at once. You have to be patient and let yourself just, you know, do that bad, shitty, horrible early draft that's, um, hang on, something is weird in my view. All right, that, that draft that's just um, all over the place because later on when you have the draft that's all over the place, this is when you can actually go back and read it or give it to an advisor Right, so back to what I said before, help your advisor help you. Your advisor is much more useful when you are giving them a chapter, right? They will meet you when you say, well, here's 30 pages. Can you read this and then set up a meeting with me and then we can talk over it. And then, you know, tell me if it's, I'm trying to do too many things in, at once here. Is this something that is all in chapter two or should this be a part of chapter two, three and four, etc. right? So that's the advice. All right, so back to sharing this. Okay, so, um, and again, and I talked about this before. Hang on, I'm having a Zoom. All right, so um, let me jump to this, the topic. All right, so what is your topic? I always say this topic, is more important, it, it's not just, okay, I'm a global media scholar and my topic is global media. No, when you are getting ready to write a dissertation, your topic is a much more nuanced, articulated um, intersection of things that you brought together. And it's not a natural occurrence. It's not on day eight, God made your topic. You are creating your topic. And by spending, enough time. So this is uh, answering a question that kept coming up. How to start, how to start, how to start. Start by, by developing an understanding of your topic. Um, your topic brings together the theoretical, scholarly, conceptual traditions that you work within, right? And it, it's, um, and it brings, 
So let me just read this. Bring together the theoretical scholarly conceptual tradition you work in with a new specific phenomenon, right? So for example, I can talk about my dissertation. I was looking at, uh, at television globalization. I was looking at uh, the theory of television studies being so American centric. And, and all the case studies that I was looking at uh, an Israeli television as an Israeli had a completely different history it's not a commercial medium, it's a public medium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when I was looking at television genres or, uh, and then formats, which was my topic, the intersection of, I love television studies. I love how they talk about, uh, you know, about television genres and forms, but, but this is a very historically specific thing. And it actually is very different than what I see when I look at Israeli television. So my experience, and research of Israeli television. Uh, my oral histories that I did with creators from the 80s on, da, 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 da. All of that was the phenomenon. And it did not fit quite well with what my field was training me to do because I was in an American-centric field of television studies. That intersection became not my topic yet, but the beginning of my topic, right? You see, so you got to be patient with kind of like an um, hourglass shape where you are willing to let your topic emerge from bigger intersections that you understand, okay, here's where I stand. From my perspective, the research I've done and what I've read from my field and what I've been trained to do in my field, the intersection of these two things is where my contribution is going to come out of, right? So you work hard at locating your topic this is the work of early drafts and at the stage of incubation. So hang on, let me see if I want to. All right, so uh, here is a little activity that's, uh, and I can't spend time on it today, but like in my class, we do outlines and roadmaps, right? And I say, this is not a process activity. It comes, this is productive work. So back to um, Robin's point, right? Robin, when we were saying, uh, what is productive? So spending time journaling, thinking, um, let me show you the book I've, I, I used for that. So look at this fantastic book. This one is called Writing with Quiet Hands. It's from the uh, creative writing work, how to shape your writing to resonate with readers. Um, it has a really hands-on, okay, let me go back and share a little thing that's called the bubble. Let me see, I think, actually. Okay, hang on. Okay, where are the bubbles? There you go. So look at this, finding your substance. So again, this is adapted from, it's gonna look different for a research project, but the idea is that you allow yourself to, uh, what we call it like um, mapping or dreamstorming or brainstorming, bubbling. So, you know, you put in, so for example, I would say, uh, so this is for, you know, if you're trying to locate a topic for your, um, creative writing. But what I would do for uh, academic writing is that I would put in, hang on, I would put in that middle, you know, television studies. And then I would put, you know, the Israeli sitcom I've interviewed everybody from. Uh, and then the, I looked at three time periods, right? So I, I would put the time periods and I would put the research I did and the, the literature I'm interested in. Right, and I would put all of this in the bubbles around, and I and then what the the thing the actual uh, exercise is to then journal about making connections between these points, and actually, it may seem like it can actually mess you up and become more messy, but it's a very important stage. So another thing I talk a lot about in my class and work, you know, I work with people to to learn to tolerate weaving order through confusion. You gotta have that chaos and that, you know, your own brain's chaotic, beautiful friction. That friction is productive. But if somebody is confused while they're working on the dissert their dissertation, they panic. So if we panic in the moment of fertile confusion, we are going against the natural process of creativity. The creative process is not, uh, you know, there's a quote I, I often use, it's not uh, a, a, a machine, it's an ocean, right? It's, it's unpredictable. 
and you go out and sometimes the water calm and sometimes it's you know stormy etc etc every day you find something you know you can find something different washed out to shore so you have to learn to be patient as you work through the stages so Robbie, maybe I will put you on the spot. Do you know if I would were to put you on the spot and say, what is your topic, the topic of your dissertation? Would, are you where you, I don't expect you to be there. Are you where you can say it in two or three sentences? If so, great, right? Um, if not, that's also okay, right? So please understand that carving out what your topic is is a lot of hard work and that is early work and this is work you absolutely need to do before you can move on to understand the rest of the structure of what you need to do. All right, so let me get back to the second, I wanna quickly share this today. So then the second part, right? Remember here, there's what is your topic and then what questions are you asking about your topic? All right, so this is often called research questions in our world, right? So, but let me explain something about research questions. You don't, you can't have your fully blown, articulate, beautiful research questions before you finish writing the goddamn thing. <laughs> and it sounds paradoxical, right? But so here's the thing with that. When you start out, you can have a very generic, wide kind of crude research question. What is the significance? So remember my dissertation, right? My question was like, I have a square peg and a round hole, right? What can I make of it, of my television that's different? You know, my television being me knowing American television, but also knowing Israeli television, you know, with this specific question of forms, I was writing about the sitcom and, I'm not getting into that, right? But what is the meaning of all this? Everybody, put it on a pillow, embroider it on a pillow, right? Your first big question, what is the significance of all this, right? What is the meaning of the phenomenon I'm looking at and in juxtaposition with the traditions I'm joining, right? With the research traditions, with the body of knowledge I'm working within. This becomes more developed, more articulate, more nuanced, and breaks down into more and more specific questions as you continue to work. Again, I, I'll give the quick uh, example here that I gave, I think, in another one of these talks. When you give a freshman composition, you know, I was doing, you know, reality uh, well, uh, television studies, and I would have the students write about reality TV, and a lot of them wanted to write about race, and they wanted to write about stereotypes, right? So, when they first started watching Atlanta's Housewives, they would be like, I want to write about the stereotype, you know, what is going on with the show and stereotypes. By the time they finished going back and forth and writing draft, I would have them extrapolate a more nuanced question. So for example, if they found three main representations, I would have them go back and write in the beginning, what are the three representations, right? And that's the research question. But before you went in and you saw that there were three, you couldn't write the research question. This is a simple example, but I'm sure it can pertain, I know, because I've seen it, it can pertain to any, it can pertain to monographs, dissertations, MA physicists, whatever. You work on understanding from a bigger question of what is going on here into, okay, you start seeing what's going on and then you write a question and the question is a rhetorical tool. It's not a real question. It's already your answer, your answer to questions that you articulated as you did your research, right? So then you can go back and say, what are the three discourses framing blah, blah, blah. But at first you were just like, there is this phenomenon and people are talking about it and it's whatever, you know, or again, I'm trying, I'm, I'm using examples from my uh, area, but I do want to say this because I know a lot of people here are doing qualitative work or, you know, people that would watch this. I can tell you your data collection analysis when it's numbers, but I can tell you that much. When you are writing a dissertation, you're telling a story about the significance of the research you did. I don't care if it's geology, archaeology, uh, behavioral psychology. I don't care if you're looking at numbers or archives 
or you did uh, uh, observations on the set of a reality show like I did, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, you're, you're, you know, you've accumulated a mass of information and data. And when it's time to write it, you need to tell us what the topic is and what you're asking about it. And here's the next stage. What are you going to do to answer the questions you asked about your topic? Here is where your data comes in and, and you know, research method, but, but the methods are just a part of it because part of what you're going to do, so let me go back to this and show you then the whole methods thing. All right, so then, right, what is your topic? What are you asking about it? And then what methods are you employing to answer your question about your topic? Um, so this can be confusing because I call it methods, but basically, I count literature review as part of this part of, 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 of the, the process. You know, your topic, what you're asking about it, and then what are you going to do to answer? So the first thing you do in a dissertation is you tell us the conversations you're joining. And this is what a literature review is. Oh, too much sun. All right, so listen to this, because this is important, and I know it's answering a question that you guys have. My best advice to not get lost in a literature review is to understand that it's a part of the story that you are telling to support what you are asking about what your topic is, right? So you have a topic, you have questions about it. And so the first introductory move is to say why what came before you doesn't answer this. So two things, what came before you helped you shape your questions and your topic, right? You are working within a tradition. So for me, for, for example, post-colonial global theory helped me shape the question about if I'm looking at the same phenomenon from a marginal place in the global system, right? I didn't need to write all the theory about development theory because that exists. But I did need to explain how development theory, for example, fit within informing my question. So that's what Lit Review does. So instead of just you summarizing everything that ever has been written about your topic, treat the literature review as an, it needs to be a very lean, mean machine that really has no extra information. Only the most, the minimal amount of relevant information that explains what came before you, what gaps remain, and then look at this, the make room for me, right? It make, you make room for you by saying, all these wonderful conversations that happened helped me shape a question about my topic, but they didn't answer this. And by doing the research that I've done, I've went on camel's back into an archaeological dig. I spent a year in prison interviewing prisoners about whatever. I did, I watched 30 seasons of Israeli television, blah, 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 blah. I've done this, I did this, I analyzed it in this way, I analyzed it in that way. But that helped me answer the question that remained unanswered, the gap that I recognize in the existing research because the phenomenon I looked at from where I'm standing with the training that I got in this field and with this question that I have about the topic that's interesting to me, that's that's the make room for me move so um i don't i don't I'm, I'm hoping i'm not going too much into this but and soon i will have to uh move on because my family is going out to dinner and if i don't join i'm just missing so uh, hang on so but i do want to go back to right so the question one so with the question you start with a wide kind of generic question that evolves into growing specificity right, from what is the significance of, what can we learn from looking at, does this work, not work, etc. Hang on, so I don't know if it's a chat, okay. Um, and, okay, I said this about the literature review, okay, the last stage, in conclusion. So your paper or your dissertation, right, at the end must explain how the method employed help you answer the question about your topic, right, and why all of the above matter. And this is uh, how you really answer the famous what is at stake question, right? Which is a favorite staple of PhD committees when they ask you, okay, what's at stake in your, in your thing? So in conclusion, you need to say, 
okay, this is the topic, this is what I asked about it, this is what I do in order to answer it, and this is the answer. And it's many answers. But here's what I want to say about that in terms of other questions that came up, which is like, how do I plan? How do I start? How do I structure the thing? Your research questions, this is like a big one, so pay attention, can be the rationale for your chapters. So people were asking me all the time, again and again this week, how do I organize my chapters? How, tell me what chapter one should look like and what chapter two should look like and what chapter three should look like. I don't know. It's your dissertation. And by what I mean, I'm not trying to be mean about it, but what I'm trying to say is, depending on your topic what you and depending on what you asked about your topic and depending on what you did in order to answer the questions about your topic your dissertation might have a very different structure so for example if what you did was comparative let's go back to my television studies idea right so if i was comparing if i decided at the end to compare the 80s with the 90s and i took the main show in the 80s and the main show in the 90s that demonstrated my point in my case you know in the 80s they adapted a sitcom and well in not in the 90s but in the noughties in the year 2000 they adapted a reality show okay and i compared them then the structure of my dissertation would make sense that there will be you know an equal amount of chapters, either like I'm going to write one, two, and three about the one show and three, four, and five about the second show, or I might decide to do a different structure and braid it and then say, okay, I'm going to talk about the production, the reception, right? So the production of the show, the text of the show, and the reception. And then I'm going to have a chapter on the production history of, uh, like, comparative through uh, like each chapter we talk about the two shows and we go back and forth between the production there is whatever I'm just this is none of this happened in my thing I'm just giving you an example right if I talked about three shows I might decide to organize it differently right so what you did to answer the questions about your topic dictates your structure for your chapters and there are many many different ways to organize that so it's about storytelling. It's about coming up with a structure that would help you tell a story. And so when you have done the preparation, the work of thinking through it, incubating, understanding what your topic is, what you're asking about it, and what you did to answer the question, and then what the answers are, that work would just roll out the red carpet. You would be able to then write the goddamn thing because so many times when you can't write it is because you didn't give yourself time to fully conceptualize it. So that's my main kind of behind the curtain dirty secret. The work is not just you sitting there and hoping that somehow a fully structured dissertation would come out of you, you know, would come pouring out without, you know, and, and I'm not blaming you guys, you know, uh, all of us who struggled and those who are struggling still writing a dissertation. I'm not blaming you for not knowing this. We're not being taught that. Um, but that's the work. So in terms of other questions, I really need to start wrapping up. But uh, if anybody that's in the, um, you know, let me do a speaker uh, gallery review. In this call, I've, and I've not answered your question, let me see if there's anything on the chat. Uh, Megan, do you have, uh, any other questions that you want to highlight for me? Uh, no, um, but that was all really great advice. Um, just uh, also because I'm looking to turn my dissertation into a book and how to sort of reformulate it for um, or, or reposition it for a more general audience than my dissertation would have been. And I think revisiting some of those just very preliminary questions that I asked myself at the very start of my dissertation for a very specialized community, just going back and doing that again, it's really helpful. So. Absolutely. And so that's another transition, right? How do we take the dissertation then transition it into a monograph? How did my question grow since I've answered my questions, right? And that's a big one too. So, you know, so again, yeah, I love that you were mentioning this because this is, you know, so many times, you know, we wrap up the dissertation. Um, because it's a ritual at some point it has to be over you just wrap it up wherever it is and they you know and you defend it and you get the two letters and you move on right the dissertation is just the first sometimes not even the first it's one product out of a project the project is the research right Disserta you know you might have actually already published uh, articles based on the same project and then the dissertation based on the same project 
and now maybe a book based on the same project, right? So it's a really big one to go back and kind of reanimate the project. A lot of time has to do with either you, you know, you step back and you ask a wider question. Many times this is the way forward from dissertation to a book. Sometimes, you know, you have to go back and do more research. So if you study something that continued, for example, you know, if, if with television, it's so often the case, right? You studied and then now there's been six more seasons of whatever, right? And you can't write the book without the timeliness of the, of, um, so for example, it's kind of funny, but one way to solve that is that if you had a timely topic and it got old, go back to history. Actually, don't find a newer topic, but go and write something, you know, compare it to something that happened even before. And now you have like ancient history and recent history. So here's what, you know, there's so many creative ways to go about reanimating the question, but this is such a good uh, point that, you know, this little hack that I gave you, which seems so simple, but it's not simple at all. It is my, um, again, I always say stop, drop and roll, like if you're on fire. This is my go-to hack. It works like magic whenever somebody is confused, because when you get, it, it can be when you're confused before you wrote a proposal, and this is what you need to cover in your proposal. What is this topic? What am I going to ask? What am I going to do to answer? Um, it helps you when you're lost inside a chapter. It can be specifically then for your chapter. Okay, in chapter one, the topic is, right, you see, it breaks down into more. Chapter one zooms in on this, asks this, answers by doing that. Chapter two, right? So, by the way, I'm answering 500 of the questions because people ask me about proposal, about process and planting, uh, planning, sorry, about argument, Oops, sorry. There's, sorry for the ambulance in Decatur, Georgia. About argument structure and analysis, all of these things can be answered by this one simple hack. Again, it's simple to explain the hack. It's not simple to do the work. But formulas are fantastic because they save us time because they simplify something complicated. So here's another thing I want to say about this. You want to go and find the models Right? So if you're writing a dissertation, read dissertations that are similar in topic, but also in structure to what you're doing. If you are now taking your dissertation and you're trying to do a journal article, find a journal article that does something similar in structure or substance, et cetera, et cetera. So, and again, back to uh, Robin, what you were saying about being productive, and I'm sorry if I'm putting this on you, but it's so many times, you know, this is Taking a day to study other people's work and the model from the work without further agenda, just I'm going to study it. You can take notes if that's your style or you can just, you know, whatever. Um, you can take notes that compare it to your work or you can take notes, whatever you need to do. That's the work. That's a work day. I don't know how you write something without analyzing the conventions of the genre. And a dissertation is a genre. You need to understand how other people did it. Even to see that some people in your field that are really, really highly regarded wrote horribly shitty dissertations, which is what you find out a lot of the time when you go back to see the dissertations that people wrote in your field. Um, yes, yeah, study those models. Look at the structural, how did they structure their argument? What was the rationale to organize the chapters? And please understand, again, I don't care if, it's, if you're looking at data from engineering, public health, uh, or the humanities, there's a storytelling component. And you can't tell a story without thinking of your audience. So how do you take an audience through explaining to them what your topic is? What are you asking about it? You see, <laughs> I'm going to continue to say this a lot, but that really is helpful. So, you know, and then what are you going to do to answer it? And again, the different, uh, the research questions, if you end up, developing three it can you know they can break down into three more and then you know you have three main um like again acts almost again i'm i'm, I'm throwing in some stuff from narrative theory right you start a narrative with a complicating event in my class we're going to look at all of those theories a lot right so complication resolution right uh there is no story if the prince is bored but if the prince killed his father accidentally and married his mother then we have a complication correct oedipus right so etc so you need a complicating event now that part is really easy in academic writing your complicating event 
is your question, is your topic, right? Because you're complicating uh, things by saying everything that came up until what I'm writing didn't cover this gap. And that's a complication. So then my dissertation would resolve the complication, right? So this simple um, narrative theory of, you know, you need to uh, introduce complication and resolution can help you think. So that's an alternative kind of hack. You know, what is the complication? What is the resolution? So you have a big one for your entire dissertation. Now think about one for each one of your chapters, right? Now chapter one will show you the history and it will show you the complication there. And then, you know, going to the 80s, there's, there was a new complication and uh, whatever, like I'm giving you one that's bringing chronology, but not leaving it at this happened and then this happened, but introduce another device to create a tension to make the reader want to follow what you're saying. So you see, again, I'm only giving you a taste of this, but these are the kind of things that can really help. So, okay, a couple of books today with, uh, when we talk about craft. I really love this one, Thinking Like Your Editor by, um, her name is uh, Susan Rabin Rabiner and Alfred Fortentu. I, I can't, Fortinetu. Uh, how to write, how to, thinking like your editor. This one is for people writing serious nonfiction, but it has, a, the two first chapters are just phenomenal. And it's about writing a, a book proposal, um, thinking, yeah, how to write a proposal. So chapter two, and then, uh, the other one is wrapping up your submission, so that might not be relevant for academics, but this, like, they're, the way they're thinking about write, uh, writing a proposal is a fantastic way to think through a project. Clockwork Muse from Eviatar Zumavel, I mentioned it last time, it's a really good uh, kind of like step-to-step -step guide. Uh, he has this um, beautiful chapter called A Mountain with Stairs, and he talks about how do you create steps in the, you know, to climb the mountain step by step by step by step. And this is more specifically teaching you how to outline a um, academic um, project. So this one is great. Another one is this one, The Elements of Academic Style by, by Eric Hayot. And again, what I'm trying to say is that taking time while you're writing a dissertation to read books about writing and to think through the structure of your work is relevant productive work. And I really recommend that you do it because you will see that it gives your brain an opportunity to think through your project and then write about it. And another thing that I want to say before I have to really have to go, right? Um, get rid of the thought that you're just going to sit there and write your final draft of the dissertation from A to Z. Today I'm writing the first two third words of my it's, that's not how it works. You know, you gotta allow yourself to write messy, convoluted first drafts uh, where you're locating your topic, you're locating your questions. You know, if you work for six months, I'm sorry, I know that freaks out a lot of people, but if you work for six months and your what you got out of the six months is that you understood your research questions, that is a win. Because once you understand your research question, you know, writing, the actual file of it's like now there's power tools <laughs> everything is can you guys hear the power tools <laughs> hang on Woo. all right it's like everything is telling me that i need to wrap this up all right but um once you understand that you can't have your research questions even your topic fully until you finished not just the first draft but maybe the second draft um then you will continue to beat yourself up for not being able to somehow show up and just write, uh, you know, like Athena leaping fully armor out of Zeus's forehead, right? That birth, you know, out of Greek mythology. This is not how you give birth to a dissertation. It's a lot more like real pregnancy, you know, where for nine months <laughs> you lose your original shape and you're completely, you know, uh, taken over by something that's growing and you have no control over the growth or how it would come out. How about that? It's a lot more akin to how you write a dissertation than this idea of it's just going to leap out. Back to one, something that continues to 
come up with that is that this is why the habit of waiting to the deadline and writing to the deadline that, you know, there was this freshman seminar that you wrote that way and you got an A because it was good enough to get an A for a freshman seminar because you waited for the last minute. Yeah, that's not going to happen for a dissertation. That's not how, it's not going to come out perfect in the same way. And by the way, the freshman seminar was just good enough to get an A for a freshman seminar. It wasn't perfect. You know, the, what happens is we start thinking that because we succeeded with this maybe once, maybe many times for shorter things, that this is a re reliable, dependable practice for our writing, but not so. All right, let me see if I'm missing another, okay, motivation. So that's a big one. How are we doing on time? We are so, okay, I gotta finish this, but I'll just say this, and I've mentioned this in other videos, so go back and watch my other videos. If you feel like you're struggling with motivation, what you, re what you are really struggling with is that you are expecting yourself to write that last draft and you can't do it because you're not understanding the work that's involved and then you become anxious and then you become fearful and then there's i call it like the uh, reverse magnetic field between you and your computer and your desk and you just because you know another thing that happens is that you are being hard on yourself um and so coming to work on your work starts feeling it, you, you dread it you start dreading it because you are being mean to yourself. So when you, if you know that whenever you're going to sit down to work, you're going to, you know, start feeling that you're a total failure. Hey, guess what? You're not going to want to go there because nobody wants to be told that even if it's by yourself that you're being told that, right? So I like another metaphor. I like to think about this as, you know, you're, you're a bad start menu. You know how on grandma's computer, <laughs> It takes forever for the computer to start. Did I already? I probably mentioned that before, um, because uh, the start menu is too heavy, and all you know, like Skype wants to open, which is everything kind of got on the start menu of the computer. What do you need to do? You need to clean the start menu. So you need to clean your start menu. Your start menu is to come into your workspace and already tell yourself that you're a fuck up and you're not motivated and you're lazy and you're procrastinating and blah 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 blah. So you need to create a new ritual or you don't need to but to get unblocked i recommend to try to become mindful about the fact that you're doing this and take there are steps like very simple basic steps that you can take in order for you to not do that to yourself and around the writer's block uh, that i showed you before and now my books know how to just disappear on me <laughs> I don't know where it is. Um, but yeah, Roseanne uh, Bain around the writer's block is a really great start for that. You know, you want to just figure out a way to start working without deciding that you're failing at it. And so understanding that it's a process, that the process has stages, that most of the stages look like you staring in space thinking or, you know, you're doodling or you're doing whatever it is, but it's not this. Uh, many of the stages include you thinking about structure, you thinking about what you're trying to say, what are you, you know, how you constructed that topic, how, what are you asking about it, how are you going to answer, uh, you know, and then understanding how the different chapters, and then doing it, right? I'll say another thing with that. Don't get into a place where all your drafts are like, this paper will say, this paper will do, just do it. You know, there's this also a lot of, uh, first chapters that I get as first draft that I used to get from my PhD students were like, this dissertation will, it will look at, it will do this, it will do that. So then you need to get to the part where you actually start doing it, even if you're doing it really badly at first. Then you, there's something for me to correct. There is something for your advisor to correct. There is something for you to correct. If you're willing to write like a really ugly, horrible, messy draft. All right. I talk about not navigating the outside pressures a little bit. Um, I do want to emphasize this. Boundaries. Have boundaries, and especially in COVID time. So a lot of you were you know, saying that all of a sudden now you can do it. It's not a surprise, right? Because as you lose privacy, as you lose control over you know, your alone time, I would be surprised if people didn't struggle. Right, because, and especially, I mean, I see it like with, with uh, 
it's a gender thing how you know there's no way around it you know when my husband is well you know look at this now nobody came in my room right because everybody understands that i'm doing this but when it's my writing time it's a lot harder to tell everybody no you can't just come in here unless you're bleeding right so that's an example for boundaries that you know you have to respect your time to work and put boundaries around it and let me say a big big thing here nobody's it's nobody's business what you do during the time that you're writing so if they come in and they see you you know just thinking or doodling or incubate you know and they can have judgments about it you know let's say we got you to stop having judgments about all the different activities that you need to do to write that are not just this right and if somebody else comes in and they have oh but i am with the kids but you're just sitting here listening to music doodling and then you have business so you know you have to have these boundaries of privacy around your work and this goes back to what i said early on the first answer i had lie you know don't come out and be like oh it's a be like i made progress even if you know you were holding compassionate space around the fact that you just needed to sit there and think about it and you couldn't you're not ready to write yet okay you don't owe anybody outside of yourself an account about what your process required you to do at a given day when you were working on your dissertation. And if what you needed was to just go to your bed lighter and stare at the ceiling, then that's what you needed. So legitimate that shit to yourself. And then by residing in the fact that that's okay, you create a boundary for others because you know, you're not interested. Listen, I finished my dissertation with a newborn and my in-laws came from Israel to be with us and love them. They, you know, none, I don't think any of them even had a BA. So their judgments about what it looks like for me to write, I, I could not care about it. Because if I started caring about it, it looks like I'm lazy or it looks like, you know, so if somebody doesn't understand our process, you know, first of all, you need to understand your process. But then if somebody from outside of the room doesn't understand your process, then you need to get rid of their eyes and their gaze. All right, my friends. Uh, any other big questions that you want answered today? So just a quick, uh, as you think about that, uh, just a quick plug. My class has a couple more spots. I'm actually getting pretty full, but uh, there's a couple um, more spots. It's a 10-week series. If you want more information about the class, go to Academic uh, Writers Unblock um, or email me at Sharon Shah. I'll just put it in the chat. Uh, okay, sh 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 it's Sharon Shah. One, two, at gmail.com or you can always DM me on Facebook. Uh, I am getting ready to stop, uh, you know, uh, move, for, move forward from the marketing into the, uh, I'm, I'm building the class website, et cetera, et cetera. But there's room for a couple more. If this is not for you right now, please tell others that, you know, I have, a, uh, you know, this could be really useful. There's going to be a class in the summer as well, for sure. This is the first time I'm trying to do it over the, uh, leading to the winter break and and then over uh, winter break, I think that this could be really useful because so many people are trying to finish at least chapters or you know dissertations even during the break and they have deadlines. And while it feels counterintuitive to take a class and add to your workload, my class, as you can see maybe from this presentation, provides you the support to carry you through, not by me carrying you through, but by you carrying, right? You're, you're the rod and not the fish. It gives you all the tools you need in order for you to stand in your power, understand your process, and get the damn thing defended. So that's why, it, or, you know, finish if it's not a dissertation. All right, so I hope I answer all the questions. I know there's so many more questions, but I hope I answered some. And I really appreciate everybody that jumped on the call. And this would be... Um, posted. I will have to do some trimming, <laughs> but this would be posted on uh, my group and I will try to post it on some other group. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone that's uh, writing. I see that some people are writing like thank you and stuff. And uh, have a great rest of your evening or night.